Now, as I told you, last week we have seen how to customize various front panel objects in order to enhance the look of the graphical user interface. We have seen how to modify the boolean buttons, we have seen how to modify graph uh, indicators as well as the gauge indicators etc. in order to enhance the, the user interface. Now, this week we will see how to customize VI, how to customize the appearance of the VI, how to customize the appearance of the front panel, the appearance of the window itself. Now, this is very important in order for a user interface to be very easy to use for the customer. Now, there are various properties of the VI which can be used in order to enhance the user interface of the VI. Now, to give you an example, whenever we use a software, in case there is a user authentication which is required by that software, it's typically done by a pop-up dialog box. So, as soon as you click login or something, you will get a pop-up dialog box and then you can enter your name, username and password and click OK and those details will be sent to the software and appropriate action is taken. Or for example, if we uh, have a software and there is some error which has happened in the background, now that error is typically thrown out as a dialog box and then it's typically thrown with a message and there are some of the errors which do not allow you to interact with the, hard, with the rest of the software like there are some fatal errors which in which case if, if they occur unless you resolve that error you will not be able to interact with the rest of the software. Now how do we make such windows using LabVIEW is were the first, first part of this webcast. Now to show you I will show you how to improve the user interface in this respect. I'll first show an example of a small password window. Now, as soon as I run this particular VI, you can see that a pop-up window opens in which, into which I can enter my username as well as the password and click OK and this particular VI passes on the data to the, to the next VI whichever authenticates that particular password. Now how did we manage to do this? How did the pop-up VI come? Now to see that we can see that the pop-up VI is nothing but a sub VI. As you can see on your right side we have a sub VI and whenever I run this VI the pop-up window opens. Now, let me open this sub VI. How is the sub VI different from the normal sub VI that you create or the normal VI that you create? Firstly, it is appropriately sized as, as per the size that I want it to be when it uh, you know pops up and it has typical controls and buttons as the usual sub VI has. More importantly, the properties, the VI properties of this particular sub VI are a little bit different from the normal VIs. So in order to view the properties of this sub VI, I go to file VI properties. Now the usual uh, option which is ticked for if you create a new sub VI, sub VI is default option. Now I have, cho I have chosen custom option because I want this sub VI to behave as if it is a pop-up dialog box. And what are the customizations that I have performed? Here are the customizations. So window has a title bar this is during runtime. So the window of course it should have a title bar saying that it is a password display win, uh, window and it does not have a menu bar. Of course for a password uh, display pop-up you don't need to have a file uh, you know edit view project this kind of menu bar. You don't need to have a vertical or horizontal scroll bar and hence I have disabled these. And then you don't need to have the toolbar that is the run, run continuously application font etc. So these options need not be there. And then the window behavior is default. So what is default window and what is floating window, what is model window we will be seeing in some time. Now the default, uh, now with these options I can, I click OK and 
these options are the options which make the window behave as it does when it pops up. So whenever the particular VI is called, whenever this VI that you see on the right side is called, the window opens up and this is how it looks like. Now, if you see, as soon as I run this program, I can interact with each of these windows separately. In case, if I want to prevent the user from interacting with the windows present in the background, unless this window is resolved, like even if you click here on the outside, the transfer, the window should not get transferred into the background window. Only after this window is cleared, it can it needs to be transferred to this. That option can be changed again in the VI properties. So we go to file, we go to VI properties, customize. So the window behavior instead of being default, we can choose it to be model. And now I done this. Now unless I, unless this window is resolved, I am not allowed to interact with any of the windows present in the background. This may be necessary, especially in the case of error windows, when an error message is thrown, you will need to resolve that error and only then need to interact with the background. Only if I type something here and click OK, only then I proceed to interacting with the window in the background. Now, similarly, we can change runtime size that is uh, the window size which happens you know during runtime and what is the uh, you know the positioning of the window like window runtime position is it centered is it maximized is it minimized is it custom so so all these options so where does the window lie when it's uh, when when it runs like for example if it is centered and i run it so So as soon as I run it, the window, pop-up window appears necessarily in the center. So similarly, there are a lot of other options like the window uh, runtime size, use current panel size. So basically whenever the window is running, it uses the current panel size. So all these are the options which are present in the VI properties. So just to summarize, what we have seen earlier is how to customize front panel objects, that is what you put on the front panel. In this uh, part of the session, we have seen how to customize VIs, like the appearance of the VI, the window appearance of a particular VI, So, we, the, which is what we have seen here. And another important property which needs to be kept in mind is the VI needs to open whenever it is called. So show front panel when called. This option is a very important option which needs to be ticked. Usually by default this is not ticked for a sub VI. You need to go to the open the sub VI properties and tick this explicitly so that the window opens up whenever it is called. If this is not ticked, LabVIEW will just run the VI without actually opening the front panel. Having said this, let's proceed ahead to the other parts of today's session. So we have seen that the VI and the appearance of the window can be customized. Now, the next question and the most important question of today's session is, can these tasks be done programmatically? Like, for example, the last week's tasks, which is customizing the front panel indicator, and today's task of customizing the window appearance, can it be done programmatically? By programmatically, we mean that from the program, we should be able to change it while the program is running. I should be able to change the color of a Boolean while the program is running. I should be able to hide or make visible an indicator when the program is running. Now, is it possible to do it using programmatically? Yes, it is possible and using the property nodes. Now, in order to show you why property nodes are so important, I will show you a sample application. It is best understood by a sample application. Now, you see here that we have a UI, we have a VI in front of us 
and whenever I run the VI, firstly it resizes. You can no longer see the file or the run and run continuously. These options are no longer seen, which is how it should be for a, a distributable application. So as soon as I run this, the window resizes, the file, etc., those menus disappear. And whenever I press start, you can see that on the left side, whatever controls and indicators are there, they get disabled for a moment. So as soon as I press start, the sampling rate, number of samples and mode, these options are, get disabled. And hence, so why is this option essential? Because when the acquisition is happening, I don't want the user to change these properties and expect some result especially. Hence, it is a very good UI and feature to have these disabled especially when the program is running. So as soon as I start, this particular uh, part of the code gets disabled. You can also see that at the bottom I have a text which is, dis which is displayed only while acquiring. So only if I press start, only when it's acquiring this text is displayed. Now these features, let us see how they are implemented in the background. Now these are the property nodes which help us in implementing these features. So, so we will go in more detail in step by step. Now as we have seen the sample application now we will be able to understand better why property nodes are required. Now, again what are property nodes? Just to uh, revisit them, property nodes are nodes which can be used to programmatically change front panel appearance. So in the program, depending on the user input and the state that you are in, you can change the uh, appearance of the front panel. Now let us see, go to go back to lab view and check how do we actually create these property nodes. Now let's consider a simple control boolean indicator. Now I need to create a property node for this. So how do I do that? I can create it like this. Create reference. So the reference, so this boolean as you see here is the reference of this LED. Just to avoid confusion let me name it as LED. So this is the reference for my LED. Now this reference needs to be passed to property node. Where are property nodes situated? Right click, go to functions palette, application control, property node. Now, as you can see, property node has two inputs and two outputs. And the two inputs, one of them is the reference. So the reference is the reference of the, uh, of, of the front panel object. And the other input is an error input. In case the uh, prior part of the LabVIEW code in front of this provides an error, then the, the property node is not executed and all the default values are returned as an as output. So this is for error handling, the two error terminals. And the same reference is passed on in case you want to do further modifications to this particular uh, front panel object. So the first part is create reference and the second part is select and edit object and the third part is of course to check for errors. Now. Now, so what are the properties are present for this particular LED? We can click here and check. So these are all the different properties which are present for LED. So class ID, which class this belongs to and then the bounds where, what is the bound of this, you know, this particular element and then the position, at what position on the front panel is it located, etc. Now let's start with a simple thing, visible. So this particular property called visible either makes the indicator or the control visible or invisible depending on the input that you give. Now by default a lot of the property nodes 
start in one visible orientation, uh, uh, start in one default orientation, we need to change it by right clicking on this particular property and changing it to write or read appropriately. Now here, I want to control whether the LED is visible or not and hence I change it to write. And I create a control for this. Now this is my control based on the input of which my LED is either visible or invisible. So I run it. So if because the visible button is off, my LED is not visible. As soon as I press this, may make it true, my LED is visible. When I make it false, again it is not visible. When I make it true, it is visible. Now this may seem like a very simple thing, like uh, you know you may still not understand the full use of property nodes just by this example. Let's see a few more examples in order to understand this better. Now, as, I in, as in the example that I showed you, whenever you, there are many instances where you do not want the user to interact with a particular control, especially when some acquiring is happening, etc. You do not want the user to interact with the control and hence want the control or indicator disabled. Now, let us say I have a numeric control which under usual circumstances is editable and I can give inputs through this numeric control. Now, if I want to make it disabled, I right click, create a reference to this and then I right click, go to application control, select the property node, I wire the reference of the object, the front panel object to the property node and select the appropriate property. Now, what is the property? So disabled is the property. So typically the, these property nodes, they are large in number, they are many in number and typically they are segregated into separate separate classes. So you will need to search for the appropriate property that you want to look for. In this case, because I want to enable or disable it, I figure out that disabled is the appropriate property. Now, of course, as I told you, I want it want to control this property and hence I right click and change it to write. Okay, I create a control so that I can now control this property. Now, so in this case because the option chosen is enabled, my numeric control seems in an enable way, enabled format. If I select disabled and grayed out, you can see that the that the actual control or indicator becomes grayed out and I can no longer in, in, uh, input values here. When I enable it back again, you can do this. If you see, it is the same thing which is happening in the example UI that I showed. So as soon as I run it, when I start it, it is disabled and after some time, once the acquisition is done, it is enabled back again. Now, we have seen that this is how we can uh, refer to a particular property. There is a little bit easier way of doing the property reference. So, as whenever I have a particular front panel object, I can right click on the front panel object, go to create. Instead of creating reference, I can directly create a property node. So, here I go here and disabled is the appropriate functionality and then I right click, change to write. So we have two alternate ways of doing this. The top one where we explicitly show the reference or obtain the reference and then modify it using a property node. That is one way. The other way is implicit, which means that we already right clicked on the front panel object and created the appropriate property. And that property can be inputted directly. So instead of this thing, I can have the same functionality with this code also in a little bit easier way. So let's go back to presentation. Now we have seen methods of referring to uh, properties, uh, explicit reference and then 
uh, implicit reference. So explicit reference is where we obtain the reference separately and then implicit reference is where we obtain it implicitly by right clicking on the controller indicator. Now let's go back to the VI and check where explicit reference using reference arrays is possible. So now uh, this is one very important feature which uh, sometimes some of the experienced users also may not know uh, which is that even the decorations that you have on the front panel can be uh, either enabled, uh, can either be visible or invisible or size can be changed etc. And in order to do that we will be, for, we, it is necessary for us to use explicit reference using reference arrays. So how do we do that? Let me put two decorations on my front panel. So decorations as you may know as I have told you last time are very passive objects which just enhance the look of the GUI. Now the way that I obtain reference for these is I go to the application control. VI server reference. So this is the reference which reference of this particular VI itself. So under this VI you can see that under the pane we have you know the reference to the front panel and I now choose a particular property node. front panel. So I obtain a reference for the front panel. So from the reference of this VI I obtain the reference for the front panel and from the reference of the front panel I obtain the reference for decorations, controls etc. So I now have the output of this decorations is basically the array of all the references of all the decorations. So the, this array is basically it contains the reference of this decoration as well as this decoration. And of course by using array manipulation palette I can extract a particular reference out of this and I can modify its properties appropriately. So what I have at the end of this is the reference of one of the decoration visible, change to right, I run this and because this is false the decoration is absent and because when it's true the decoration is present. Now one important uh, property which will be useful for the VI contest of this week is the positioning of a front panel object. So we will see how uh, the, fr the position of a front panel object can be changed programmatically. So I add a particular front panel object, let us say this gauge and now I create a property node for this which shows me the position of it. So this property node can be used in order to change the position of this front panel object. Right click, change to right. Now as you can see as I change the number, the position as an input, the gauge control keeps moving right side and then the top and bottom position can also be adjusted programmatically. Now why does this, why is this required? Uh, why does this make sense? Once I show you a very cool VI which has been developed, very cool user interface which has been developed, then you will understand what is the use of controlling, being able to control the front panel object's position. Now. I have a UI in front of me, as soon as I hover my mouse to a particular location or towards the edge, this uh, you know the graph window pops up, pops out and as soon as I open my 
uh, over my mouse here, this window pops up. As you may see, this is very similar to our Windows Media Player application. So, in fact, if you uh, do not uh, change your mouse position for some time, then the video becomes full screen and the slider, uh, you know, control which is at the bottom of the screen disappears. So, and that can be very much obtained, uh, very much impl implemented by using property nodes. The, at the back of this VI, we have property nodes which are implementing this position. So, what you see here is a control, graph control, whose position is changed whenever my mouse pointer is brought close to this. So, my mouse pointer position is continuously being, you know, checked in the event structure or by using mouse pointer position VI and whenever it becomes close to this particular position, the graph, the position, uh, the position of this front panel object, namely the graph changes and it comes into view. So, this week's contest is based on similar lines. So, before uh, going to this week's, uh, you know, uh, previous week's uh, winners as well as this week's VI contest, I want to take a small feedback regarding this webcast. So, so was this webcast useful to you? Could you learn something new of this webcast, out of this webcast? Okay, that's good. And now, coming to previous week's webcast. So, was the previous week's webcast as well as VI contest helpful? Were you able to, you know, uh, learn something out of the VI contest as well as the webcast? Okay, for the present webcast, around 90% of the people found it useful and for the previous webcast as well as VI contest, around 80% of the people found it useful. So, it's good. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that even next week we'll come up, come up with some interesting you know, and useful topics so that you can develop better user interfaces. Now, the winner of the previous week's webcast is Ahmad Zahran. So you can have his, uh, you know, have a look at his VI on the community. And uh, we also have a special mention uh, who, who came almost close and uh, that user profile name is Amori. So both of these uh, users have created some very good VIs and customized gauge indicators and overlaid one on top of the other for getting multiple sized, uh, you know, seconds hand as well as minutes hand and uh, hours hand clocks and uh, Ahmad Zahran made some very good, you know, very good looking seconds and uh, minutes pointers as well as Amori made a very cool continuously moving analog clock. So, both of these uh, contestants have done an amazing job and nevertheless, there were a lot of other people who have uh, done very good work and have submitted, you know, very good entries. So, Balaji, Arik Pathan, Ganesh Murthy, Manish Malkar, Shweta and Prashant, I guess. So, all of you have done a very good job. So, keep the enthusiasm going. So, I guess this week's, uh, the, the contest will enthuse you more and make sure that the participation increases. So, this week's VI contest of the week is to make a media player with as good GUI as possible. So, the GUI which I showed you uh, some time ago where the, uh, the front panel objects pop up whenever you go close to them. So, taking that as inspiration, you can make a very good GUI. So, 
the focus is not as much on the media player part itself the focus is on the graphical user interface so how to develop a very good graphical user interface that is the focus and of course the best user interface wins so, so the contest of the week is also live on labview enabled community so just to give uh, you know a uh, introduction to the new set of people who have not listened to it probably last time so labview enabled is the ni india community it's a single network of students industry professionals as well as academicians who come together and collaborate to create discussions they exchange and share resources they generate con content on the applications that they have worked on earlier and you know on nih technologies or on third party technologies using labview etc so uh, you can log on to the uh, labview enabled website and have a look at this and participate in the discussions so as i said the but this week's VI contest has been uploaded on the website as well as let's hope that we will we, this time also we will have some very interesting discussions as we had last time. So simply put this LabVIEW enabled community is, uh, is like a Facebook or social networking for engineers. You can come here, you can discuss, you can post and you can learn. So please, please feel free to have a look at this website and that's it.